Father's Day for the fathers. You know, um, every year Father's Day goes by, you put on a few more kilograms. It's unfair, isn't it, really? Um, you know, it's not like, it's unfair because the women, they can all put on weight and they can still fit their earrings. But, you know, we, we have trouble. There, there are parts of the world, mind you, that I've been in where being overweight's actually an advantage. There, there is parts of Africa, you know, we haven't got so many women here tonight, so I can share this with the men. But there's, there's parts of Africa, you know, where, where you think of a slender, athletic African woman, but actually in parts of Africa, that's not that um, desirable. There, there are parts of Africa where the desirable women have huge bottoms. Uh, you know, white men like us, if we look at them, we think it looks more like two bears fighting in the forest under a blanket. But um, they like it, you know, they think that's a pretty woman, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> where am I going with this? Um, <laughs> yeah, keep digging. Yeah, yeah. So, it's Father's Day again, that's right. And each year, uh, we we change, we experience new things, we um, are closer to the Lord, I believe. We, we trust more easily. When you get older, you know, you've been through so much, you know the Lord won't let you down. When you're young, you can worry about some things. But as you get older, you just realize, no, the Lord will never, never fail. And so there's a beautiful peace that comes on us as we get older. And we look at life differently. And um, I think we walk in a peace that, that is really wonderful that the Lord gives us as we realize how, how good a father he is. And so I, I believe that's um, where we're at today. I, I, I know that represented here, it doesn't mean to say that every family's perfect. And I've shared the same sort of testimony that we heard before. I, uh, you all know <coughs> about uh, one of my daughters. We were there last night, actually. We, we were in their home and all the fam most of the family gathered together. And, um, uh, you know, she keeps this beautiful spotless house. She's probably the best mum of all my children. She's just very efficient, works hard, but her life was uh, a mess 10 years ago. She also was on ice and married the dealer and the two of them really got into a terrible state. But if anyone asked me, I, I knew in my heart, I never worried, I knew in my heart that God had it. I knew that. And I saw that I saw the trouble, you know, because it makes them hallucinate and it makes them paranoid and it makes them really uh, very ill, really mentally. And and you know, if someone said, "How's how's Sarah?" I'd say she's fine, because that's how I saw her. I saw her healed. I saw her free. And you know, the Lord got a whole. I I didn't get the uh, the uh, opportunity to minister to my daughter during that time but my younger son did and he ministered to her and they and to her husband and they went away for about a year came back totally clean and have been ever since and just just a wonderful couple of um couple they are you know so if if you've got children that you're worried about take it from an older person don't worry god's got it he'll get them he'll get them and you believe it. Believe with the heart, confess with the mouth. That's how we got saved. It works for everything. And God will bring it to pass. So this morning, today, tonight, we've got a, a little gift for the men here tonight. And I'd like, you, I'd like you to stand, the men to stand. And I'm gonna invite you from the oldest to the youngest. Yeah. So, um, to um to take a journey over to this table there's a selection of books and you're very welcome to take whichever one appeals to you and um
If you don't know each other's ages, just go by guesswork. We've got this series going called The Presence of the Lord. And, um, you know, back in Genesis, uh, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And that was their daily routine to finish the day working in the garden or tending to the garden and then walk with God. Uh, This is an astonishing thing, that God would walk on earth with Adam and Eve. That's the relationship they had. But something went wrong, and on this day, Adam and and his wife hid themselves from the presence. See the word presence? Presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You know, there's a lot of people that are in the bush, they're in the wilderness, they're, they're in the trees, their life is one of hiding. Uh, but never, I, I think the lesson is, never hide from the presence of the Lord. Don't run from him, run to him. Genesis 3, 8 that was. Jonah was the same. It says, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Never run from the presence of the Lord. You could end up in a whale. And you won't have a whale of a time. You'll you'll be down in the depths. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. What, What? Well, Adam and Eve were driven away because of guilt. In this case... Jonah didn't want Nineveh to come to the Lord. They were enemies. They they weren't people that he loved. He didn't want them. He knew the power of the word of God. And if he preached it, he knew what would happen. And he got all grumpy about it afterwards as well. But the fact was, he'd been given a mission. Never run from your mission. Preach if you have to. Do whatever you have to. But never run from the presence of the Lord. In Genesis 27, 6, I've been really interested in Genesis 27 uh, lately. I've read it a lot. But Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make me savory food that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. There's something about a father blessing his family in the presence of the Lord. We can do that. You can bless your children in the presence of the Lord. And so, you know, what happened was Rebecca overheard this conversation and got her son, Isaac, to come and get the blessing. Jacob, sorry. Jacob, to come and get the blessing. And so Jacob rushed out and killed a couple of lambs. His mother made this meal and they slipped it in before Esau got back. And uh, he had to be covered with a skin, a hairy skin, because his brother was hairy and he was a smooth man. So the mother patched up all this stuff and put it on his arms and the back of his hands and the back of his neck. He said, it's the voice of Jacob, but it's the skin of Esau. In other words, he had to be covered and there's a, I think there's a parallel there. We, we don't go and get the blessing in our own skin, so to speak. It's given to us through Jesus. It's a funny story because he told an outright lie to get the blessing. But later on, his, his, his father acknowledged that he was blessed and told him so. But the big thing here is you can be blessed even if you're a, a schemer, a plotter, in the presence of the Lord. That's, the, that's what was happening here. It was in the presence of God. Later on, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran to get a wife. His dad had really blessed him by this stage. So he came to a certain place, stayed all night. The sun set and he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Anyone know much about that stone? You can trace that stone through history. It's... They believe that stone actually is the stone of Skewen, 
if you're familiar with that now in Scotland. Then he dreamed and beheld a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. He dreamed. So he's lying out there. He's on his way to find a wife. He's a schemer and a plotter. But he lay down and put a stone under his head and used it as a pillow. But he had a dream. Dreams are wonderful when the Lord speaks to you in a dream. And there the, were the angels of God ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it. So the Lord is down with us now. This is old covenant. But this is how good it was even in the old covenant. And he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land in which you lie, I'll give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. By the way, this is the mandate for Israel to have a homeland. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, the east, the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Talking primarily of Jesus. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and I'll bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken. He will not leave you until he's done to your family what he's spoken to you. Amen. Amen. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Hey, the presence of the Lord is here. Well, actually what he said was, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Some of the situations we get into, if we are still and know God, we can say that the Lord is in this place and we didn't know it. doesn't matter how difficult the situation is, it's really important to find that still place, to seek God, to be in his presence. I, I listen to a lot of preaching. I, I listen to my Bible. I have it going in the car when I'm going home from here. I listen to, I've, I've gone through books and books and books of the Bible in the last few weeks. But there's still a need for me to be in the place where I get still and know the presence of God. Surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. We can be in a place where the Lord is and not know it. We need to know the presence of the Lord. He's always there. We said that last week. He's everywhere but he's here and to, to be in that here place is really important for christians we need to take time to get into the presence of the lord because that touches not our intellect it touches our spirit so surely the lord is in this place and i did not know it and he was afraid and said how awesome is this place this is none other than the house of god and this is the gate of heaven so Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. It's a great story about this stone if you follow it through scripture. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back, to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. He was worried that his brother would take his life. He cheated him out of the blessing. But he said, if I come back in peace, I'm going to serve God. And this stone which I've set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Isn't that good? So in Ephesians 3.12, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So what's changed? What changed between the time when Adam and Eve fled from the presence of God? Was, had God changed? No, God was still keen to go walking with them. He turned up. That's sin. They'd done exactly what he said they shouldn't do. But he turned up to go for a walk anyhow. You see, it's not God's problem. It's our problem. It's our guilt. It's our shame. And so that's why Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. God hasn't changed. He still wants to walk with us. And so he says, 
to come into his presence, but he actually says to come boldly. You have to come boldly. Why boldly? Because our nature tells us that we should run. The law even tells us we should run. The law was designed, it came later of course, but it was designed to let us know that we were not good enough to come into God's presence and we needed a saviour. And so there is a way into the presence of God. Hebrews 4 has a similar message. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. It's not a throne of judgment. It's a throne of grace. And we come into his presence that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In the time of need, the devil will tell you you're not worthy. That's his main message. He's the accuser of the brethren. But we come boldly. We go right past him. There's a teaching that I will do one day, but it's based on the tabernacle and uh, how they used to approach the tabernacle through the outer court, the inner court, the Holy of Holies, and what they went through and how they got there. Well, it all talks of Jesus. And that's how we come boldly to find grace in a time of need. And then everything changes. Get into his presence. I, I think that's a real encouragement for us, for all of us, is to be in his presence. Therefore, brethren, uh, hold fast your confession. Verse 19, we'll go to the next one. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water it's talking about the approach to the tabernacle if we study it out but in short because of Jesus our life is washed it's clean and we don't have to wait for a priest to declare us sin free he is the priest he declared us sin free he doesn't hold or impute our sins to us or against us and so we can approach the throne of grace boldly thank you we'll take all of those how about that so You know, if you, if you can press through, uh, if you're not used to being in God's presence, you'll find it for maybe an hour, the first time you try to get into God's presence, you, your mind will go berserk. It'll say there's nothing happening, God's not here, you'll never feel God. And what about the stuff you've got to do out there and uh, have you done this and that? And, you know, he'll get you totally distracted. But if you can be still, you'll know that he is God. And it might take some time initially. You might just have to sit on your chair and close your eyes and have some music maybe and say, Lord, I am in a state. My mind is busy, but I'm just here and I'm seeking you and I'm going to be still and persevere. And with, before, maybe the first time you do it, you might have to discipline your mind more than what you've ever done. But you know, when you've done that a lot, you can just go into the presence of God. You can go into your room, the Bible says, close the door and be in the presence of God. You'll be amazed what happens in the presence of God. I went to a very legalistic church when I was young. I didn't realize that when I was there, but I was under a lot of pressure, you know, in that church to conform. And I did conform, I did it with all my heart. And, uh, but I used to get up early, maybe five o'clock when I was at school. And I'd kneel down in my bedroom and I would seek the Lord. And many times, I can say many times, the Lord came to me and took me. I, I can tell you where he took me. I don't know where it is physically. And I don't think he took me in body, but I know he took me to this lake. We used to go to this lake. I can tell you what the stones were like. And, and we would fellowship. 
just as a young boy. I used to find that a lot. And, you know, later on in my life, when I first went to work, I worked as a, an inspector for the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries in New Zealand. And uh, I, most of my work was inside what we call freezing works or um, killing establishments, you know, meat, meat works, with abattoir, bigger than an abattoir. In New Zealand, an abattoir is a local one. These are big e export meat factories, if you like, with five or six chains of sheep going, 15,000 on each line a day. A lot of sheep used to go through those places, you know. And I could do my work uh, without thinking too much because I had to do four inspections a minute all day when the season was on, so you get pretty good at doing it um, automatically, you know. And I'd start meditating and I'd start getting into the presence of God. This is amongst rough men, you know. Some of these guys were so rough. I think they'd been in jail and all the rest of it, you know. They knew how to look after themselves. And I was really like a white boy amongst them, really. I didn't know, I didn't have a clue in those days. But I'd just get into the presence of God. And sometimes, even when I was working, I remember on a number of occasions, God would take me to this place. And he had an upright piano, very similar to that one out there. And the Lord would play this, these beautiful hymns to me. You say, I can't believe that. Well, I'm not asking you to believe it. But anyway, you, you get into the presence of the Lord and come and tell your story. See what happens. God is real. And you can press through. There's no end. You can be as close to God as you want to. You've got to put some time in. You've got to be quiet. You've got to be still. You've got to say, Lord, I'm here to seek you. And it's a spiritual thing. It's not an intellectual thing. And you can get be put. John said he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. When you're in the spirit, things change. You see things. He said, John said, I saw this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He saw things. You can see things. You can get into the presence of God. These are, these are real things for Christians. I've met too many Christians in the last five years, you know, that... I've ministered in churches where people never enter into the presence of God. They have an intellectual understanding of God. We don't want to be among them because Pentecostal churches have sort of drifted a, a, a long way in some of these areas. But we just, in the old days, the Pentecostal leaders would teach their people to wait on the Lord. They that wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll walk and not faint. They'll run and not grow weary. And so we need to be in the presence of God. It's a practice. I forget the man many centuries ago who wrote a book called... Tozer. What was his name? Tozer. Tozer? Okay. Tozer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The practice of the That's it? Yeah. And so... We need to practice the presence of the Lord. And even John Wesley's mum knew about this. She would sit, she had 12 kids, I think, and busy, 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 but sit in the kitchen and get her apron and put it right over her head and just sit there and, and get into the presence of God. Five minutes in the presence of God will renew your strength, you know. You'll mount up with wings like eagles. Like the experience I mentioned last week, 30 minutes on a log can take you from extreme agony of worry and despair to a blissful peace. 30 minutes on a log at the back of the Christchurch airport. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, that's what we're doing tonight, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The Lord, I believe, is inviting us to knock on his door boldly and say, I'm here, Lord. I may not have experienced much of this, but I'm here, and I'm not here to fill in time. I'm here because I'm seeking you and I know that you want me to come and you want to have fellowship with me and walk with me in the evening and you want me to experience things when I'm in your presence. 
in your presence. So I encourage you, get up earlier if you have to. Do what you have to do to get into the presence of God. Don't put other things first, but go and put yourself in a place where you can practice getting into the presence of God. I'm not going to say this technique, so I don't think that that's the way it works. I think it's, it's just like, Lord, here I am. I'm walking in the garden. Where are you? And he'll, he'll come close. Draw near to me, he said, and I will draw near to you. Amen.